Um, welcome to the fourth and the very last webinar organized by Arafura and Timur C's Ecosystem Action, what we call the ATC2 and Oil Spill Response Limited. So at C2 and OSRL, we have collaborated this year to deliver quarterly webinars. Um, I am Sharina from Oil Spill Response Limited, the facilitator for this webinar. Okay, our hope is um, to share learning and have a productive uh, discussion through this webinar. For today's webinar, we have the honor and pleasure to actually have the following resource speakers with us. So we have Mr. Dwi Ari Yogo, um, UNDP National Project Coordinator for Indonesia. We have Ms. Hon Pui Huang, OSRL's Aviation Liaison Officer. Uh, she'll be talking to us about um, two topics. We have the oil wildlife response as well as the oil spill risk assessment. Okay, and last but not least, we have Ms. Paondi Christian. Uh, she, he's the Head of Agency of Environment and Forestry of East Nusa Tenggara Province of Indonesia. And he will be sharing with us a case study in this webinar. Okay, so to start off this webinar, I would like to invite uh, Pak Yoga, who will provide us an overview of the ATC2. Pak Yoga, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Good morning, Sharana. Uh, let, let me could start uh, for the, I want to share about the project at the uh, uh, introductions. So if I could share the screen. So uh, my name is Dwi Yoga Utama. You could uh, call me Yoga. I'm the National Project Coordinator for Indonesia uh, as part of a UNDP Indonesia uh, programs. Uh, uh, we're talking related to the what is at sea. Uh, we know that that there is, this is the fourth uh, webinar, and we always sharing the, uh, the the program itself. But let me want to uh, reintroduce uh, our programs. Uh, why we working in these issues? So uh, SC two is a uh, stands for the Arafur and Timorsis Ecosystem Action Phase 2. This, uh, it's starting, there, there is an initiation from the expert forum in Indonesia, uh, Timor-Leste, and also Australia in 2006. They want to learn more about this uh, region. You could see that's a blue, blue color, it's Arafur and Timor Sea. It's a uh, part of the uh, large marine ecoregion from Indonesia, Ireland, and also North Australia. In the first space, we uh, are more identified what is the potential in these locations and what is the big gaps uh, among the region. And then we, we develop the transboundary diagnosis analysis, and then we implemented the action plan in, in in the past two. So in the past two itself, we already start from February 2019 and will be ending by uh, 2024. So uh, why uh, this area is matter? Uh, we know that uh, we have a high biodiversity uh, ocean in this area, uh, different with the other region of uh, Indonesia that mostly uh, have a high biodiversity of uh, coral reef, but in 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 Arafura and Timor Sea, it's more a uh, different marine ecosystem. It's more related to mangrove, one of the biggest mangrove in in Indonesia, and also uh, high potential of the demersal fish, shrimp, and other uh, pelagic fisheries. But in 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 other way. There's a lot of uh, over exploitation of the melanin source. Uh, before, there's a lot of uh, illegal IUU fisheries, and also we see that there is a loss in degradation habitat and biodiversity because of uh, utilization of the community and also from the big vessel in the area from different countries. And um, the other thing, are, sorry, um, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Uh, we are not seeing your slides at the moment. Do you have them up? Yeah, we. I'm already share screen. Okay, because it's not appearing 
uh, on our screen. Uh, we can see the slides. Oh, you can. Okay. So it's a, a map. You could see the slide in the map. Uh, no, Park Yoga, we are seeing the XC2 slide. Maybe you would like to stop share and reshare again, please. Okay, okay. Mm. Okay, so let me start again. Apologies. Uh, no worries. <laughs> I think this is... Ah, okay, hold on. We are seeing something. Okay, Sharina, maybe you would like to stop share first. Okay, now we are seeing a map project overview. Is that okay. the correct slide? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Please so hold will, Yeah, we will, will follow up again. So, so the other issues in the in the region is land-based marine pollution. So we see that a lot of uh, uh, oil rig in the Timor Sea is and have high potential high potential if it's a leak. And also there is an impact of the climate change. We know that in Indonesia part we we based on the cyclone like Saroja and it's gonna be. Uh, other uh, cyclone uh, going to the uh, going to the Katulistiwa, yeah, going to this area. So th this project itself uh, uh, managed by Indonesia, uh, Timor Leste, and also PNG, and supported by the Australia uh, to to uh, addressing the transponder issues. Uh, related to specific uh, program itself, we have a three major component. A nine expected outcomes and 23 target outputs. Uh, component one is related to the uh, governance management. So we will learning from the process like uh, CTI, CFF, and we also want to facilitate uh, the, the regional government to develop the regional uh, governance mechanism. And also it will be linked with the national mechanism. Yeah, we, we, we will be uh, updated the, the, the potential of the area and also the, the issues in the area to, to support the, the action plan from among the country. And also in component two, we work uh, closely with the management of environment itself. So we know that uh, there is uh, four main issues that we work in environment and biodiversity. Is related to improve management of fisheries and coastal resources, reduce marine pollution, conserve coastal and marine biodiversity, and also integrated coastal management, incorporating with the climate change adaptations. And the, the last component we're working for knowledge management. So we want to transfer the knowledge among the country. We know that the eastern part of Indonesia it has a different approach. It's more related to the traditional knowledge, uh, traditional management of the area, and how how the the policy will dealing with and integrated with the the local uh, policy and local belief. So it that's the things that I think the Etsy one of the one of the major uh, project that link in this region. And for this webinar, we will be focusing on the output to. Point two, related to reduce marine pollution. We want to enhance data information regarding the source and seeing of contamination in ATS. So uh, speaking of that, uh, we have uh, uh, the second year of our implementation, we have uh, assessment on the land, uh, marine and land-based pollution by Dr. Xin Taiwan in 2021. It's, there is a too many issues uh, in the region. It's of course it's many leaders. I think it's it's happened uh, a lot of the water. Yeah, it's big issues in the global one. And the other things is oil spill. If we could see in the map, uh, there's a lot of consequences <laughs> of the uh, oil and gas in Timor Seas. So there is a high risk of uh, biodiversity if 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 this uh, consensus not managed very well. But uh, from the country itself, we have to prepare how to handle the, the risk uh, in, the, in these waters. In detail uh, assessment, uh, everybody could download uh, in our report. You could scan the report or also you could uh, 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 visit our website in the publications part. Uh, 
about this webinar objective, uh, we're working with the OSRL uh, to support us uh, to preparedness of the uh, oil spill preparedness in the Atesh region. And with this webinar, we want to enable information uh, sharing among and build capacity of the Atesh stakeholder and oil spill preparedness and response. Uh, the topic itself is progressive related to awareness of oil spill impact, the understanding of spill risk, and what it takes to respond to oil spill incident effectively. And we also want to introduce the key principle involved in the preparing for responding to oil spill incident. Yeah, we see that uh, uh, this is the serial webinar. The first one we already uh, talked about cause, fate, and impact of the marine oil spill. And then we also have discussed on the oil spill strategy if it happens. And we also have a, a webinar specific on the NEBA or spill impact mitigation analysis in PNG case study. And the, uh, the last one or the last webinar, we go to Indonesia. So we have, uh, will be discussed on oil wildlife response. So how the oil spill will be impact to the wildlife and how we gonna manage uh, those uh, impact and oil spill risk assessment. And also we want to uh, sharing the Indonesian oil spill case study. This is comes from East Nusa Tenggara Timor. Uh, this is, uh, we'll be talking about the uh, Marine Pollution Task Force as uh, one of the two from Indonesia side that have a uh, provincial level uh, team to handling uh, uh, risk from the oil spill in the regions. So I think uh, that's from my introduction from the uh, SC2 project. Uh, everybody could reach us in the website uh, for more detail about the project itself. And you could also contact me as well. Uh, I think that's from my part. Uh, thank you. Back to you. Hey, thank you, Pak Yuga, for your welcome remarks and also um, for providing us the background of etc 2 and the preview of the webinar. Um, so now I will just quickly share my screen back. Okay, so with that, we'll move on um, to providing a, a quick um, background of OSP response. Okay. So oil, um, oil spill response or OSRL is the world's leading global oil spill response specialist since 1985. Okay, so we are wholly owned by our members, uh, which comprise of oil, gas, and energy companies, and they are um, they represent the majority of global oil production. Okay, so our members actually gain access to um a full suite of OSRL's expertise for their response and preparedness needs on a global basis. So we have offices and um, as well as warehouses um, that are across uh, the global um, projection, of course. So who we are, again, we are the largest international industry funded cooperative and we are owned by major oil and gas production as well as transportation companies. Okay, and we provide resources, not just um, equipment, but as well um, as expertise, as well as skill sets, skill sets to prepare for and respond to oil spills efficiently and effectively on a global basis. Okay, and with that, to all participants, um, you can actually proceed to type in your questions in the chat box as early as now or later during the presentations. So do not um, worry if your questions are not read or not answered today. Um, we will actually release an online article after this webinar to actually answer all the questions that you have in this webinar. Okay, so what you see here on the screen is an attendance and feedback form that is um, uh, my administrator will actually have it shared um, the link will be shared in the chat box later okay so um, you can actually uh, fill this in and I'll explain a bit more about it later okay so without further delay our first presenter is Miss Bui Huang so the first topic that Bui Huang will um, be presenting on is on oil to wildlife response so Bui Huang the floor is yours Thank you, Sharina. Um, so just give me a few minutes to share the power 
on slides first. Shaina will need me to stop sharing this. Your thumbs up if you can see my slides. Ready? Thank you, Rachel. I can see that we have the slides shared. So, good day to everyone. My name is Pui Hang. Um, I'm from OSRL. So, just a brief introduction that uh, I'm currently the aviation liaison officer for APEC regions. But prior to that, I also I am also a duty manager uh, for response. In the sense that uh, when you call in for an event of oil spills, I'll be the one handling your call and uh, talking to uh, the incident commanders or even to help to give technical advice in the IMT or to send our people and equipments over to the site. So today, I think we start out with uh, oil wildlife uh, response. So I think this is, if you're familiar with the uh, tier preparedness and response wheel, so oil wildlife response is really falls inside one of the factors together with the SC containment and recovery, shoreline cleanup, waste management. So oil wildlife response is one of them. So the agenda for today, I will have it is uh, to understand at least uh, on the effects of oil on the wildlife, because be able to give you a broad overview on the wildlife response, preparedness, to understand what's involved in the oil wildlife response. So it started off with the effects of oil on wildlife and what is an oil wildlife response exactly, what are the response strategies available to minimize these impacts, and we'll come to understand the importance of preparedness to ensure an efficient and effective oil wildlife response in an event of oil spill incidents. So effects of oil on wildlife. So most common casualties of oil spill are the marine mammals, seabirds, and sea turtles due to their physiology and behavior. A few ways to get exposed to oil will be through direct contact, inhalations, and ingestions. So physical coating of oil onto their skin, mucous membrane, fur, and feathers can cause skin and eye irritation, suffering from chemical burns. So mammals also rely on their fur for thermal regulations. Thus, oiling reduces swimming ability and the mobility out of water. This affects the ability to hunt for food and lead to starvation. On the other hand, seabirds have feathers to serve as waterproofing functions. So oiling leads to water logging and results in loss of buoyancy, causing them to suffer from hypothermia or even drowning. So birds in general love to print on its feathers and get the oil onto their body, making them sick, developing gastrointestinal problems. Same effects when marine mammals and sea turtles ingest oil into their bodies. So in the long run, there will be chronic effects on their tissues, organs, or even reproductive functions. So damage to their respiratory systems by inhalations may lead to the immuno uh, suppressions. So in all overall, I think they bring down their immune systems and make them fall sick more easily. So on the other hand, the oil spill response actions by human interventions can cause adverse effects as the wildlife are driven away from their habitats and suffer secondary impact from inhaling the smoke generated from the vessels and power packs. So effects of oil on wildlife does not stop during the oil spill incidents, but years to count on. It may have impacted the wildlife populations level as discovered from the post spill monitoring. So I think there's a few case studies that you see here. So the first one is the Exxon Bandels. So sea otters, experience high rates of fetal and uh, neonatal loss. So I think this also in the European shed colonies following the prestige spill, the annual reproductions was around 70% lower than the historical rates up to the five years later from the, uh, the spill itself. And lastly, I think it's the very well-known deep water horizons in the Gulf of Mexico. 
So the bottle-nosed dolphins in the northern Gulf of Mexico found their reproductive success was a tip less than comparative populations in the five year studies. So I think these five year studies, but the effect is like ongoing and we do not know what is the exact impact uh, that will cause to the population levels. So, however, it's actually difficult to determine the specific mechanism of reproductive impairment in observational wildlife studies because there are factors that may constitute because to the environment, not necessarily only oil spill, but the plastics or the pollutions uh, in the current, uh, I would say that, modern world. So, but definitely, once an incident happened, the post spill monitoring will have to be carried out. And to a certain extent, they can help you to measure the impact to the wildlife uh, in that region. Another indication that you can measure the impact or the effects on wildlife would be the carcass recovery. So it's usually used as an indicator in measuring the impact on wildlife, but it is actually difficult to measure the actual impact. So why would I say so? Because you can see that there's different factors uh, in the diagram. In many cases, you only can see what you see. So the, the carcass may sink to an extent, and the green current uh, conditions may bring the carcasses away from the shore or even deeper down from the original uh, spill locations or some dying underwaters that you may not be discovered anymore. And later you will see that when they are streamed on the shoreline, it can be a remote stranding where it's not accessible by humans and you're not able to see that, the, to recover any carcasses or the scavenging by the other uh, predators in the regions. So I think all this it's, uh, will constitute to a limited accuracy for the impact on wildlife. But nonetheless, I think it formed the baseline data to, to help us understand the effects. Yep, so moving on, I think that's that like, gives you a brief uh, introduction on what the effects on the wildlife. The first, how they actually get impacted through contacting with the oil. Second, what is actually how we actually measure using the carcass recovery as well as the post spill monitoring to uh, measure the actual impact or at least close to whatever we can discover. And moving on to exactly what is oil wildlife response. So by there's a definition by Abika IOGP guide. So it states that the, it is a combination of activities that aim to minimize the impact of an oil spill on wildlife, such as birds, mammals, reptiles, by both prevention of oiling when possible and mitigating the effects on individual when oiling has taken place. So it is a broad definition that encompasses a wide range of activities from initial preventative measures through to mitigating impacts on oil animals. So an oil wildlife incidence can have complex problems. So I think one very headache and complicated ones would be the wildlife will not be able to understand what you're trying to tell them. They will not understand English or Malays or Indonesians, uh, native language or any kind of language that you're trying to communicate with them. So I think that itself really make one very complex uh, problem to solve because they will not listen to whatever you would want them to do. And secondly, I think poor level of preparedness in terms of do we actually have an existing oil wildlife plan in place? Do people know their responsibilities and roles in dealing with the oil wildlife or they do not know how to deal with them? So do we have, do we have actually adequate resources in terms of uh, trained personnel, equipment or facilities to house all these oil wildlife? And the number and types of wildlife casualties uh, can actually make a difference. Imagine uh, even a small spill can have a large impact on wildlife. It depends on the number of species or the vulnerability of the species being impacted. So even though there's only a small population, there's, if there's in the region or that seasons is a, a, a nesting seasons or a migration seas uh, seasons for other shorebirds, other seabirds to come in, 
So I think that can actually greatly increase the uh, complexity in terms of managing oil wildlife. Animal welfare issues or the local legislations. So in terms of priorities in certain species to receive treatments from others, or euthanasia is one of the options that you want to consider. Is it in the plant? Or do you only want to decide when things happen or when the incident happens, then we are talking about it. But many of times, what are the priorities in certain species to receive treatments will depend on the, I think, uh, will be from the top down, from the, I think, the national agencies, the environment agencies to advise. Or prior to that, do you actually have a list of the vulnerability list or endangered species list that we really have on hand to decide who, which type of species will get the uh, priority treatments. Humanitarian issues. So it's to protect the public from distressed wildlife, which may attack people, or even the members of public contact disease from the sick, direct contact with oil without proper PPE, or even the oil wildlife suffer from more stress and damages from the poor handling by untrained personnel. So I think this both ways, you want to protect the animals from the untrained personnel by causing more harm than good. And secondly, also to protect the public by the sick uh, and maybe dangerous uh, wildlife in this sense. And when the public want to help, whether they are having the appropriate training and PPE uh, equipped before they actually step in to handle the oil wildlife, or are they trained to handle the oil wildlife to prevent themselves from getting injured? So one good case study I would like to share will be the Rina's field in New Zealand. It's actually considered as one of the successful oil wildlife uh, response in these regions. And how is it so? So I think we trace back to when it happened. So it happened in October 2011 at the Bay of Plenty. So MV Rina was grounded and approximately 350 tons of uh, HFOs were spilled. So the wildlife response in total lasts approximately around five months. So at the height of response, we are looking to 250 people being involved. So what are their roles? They can be even doing all the daily wildlife operations, including the field staff uh, doing the recognizances and collections, or working at the wildlife facilities that care for the birds, or support staff that is actually consists of the management, logistic, planning, and the human resource. So I think in total, we have around 420 live oil birds collected and taken into captivity for decontaminations and rehabilitations. So out of the 420, I think 383 are the bitter pool penguins. I think many would know that the blue penguins is one of the important uh, I think species in New Zealand. And with the 383 birds emitted, 365 have been released back into the wild, uh, constitute to 95% success rate, which is very high. And in addition, 60 northern uh, New Zealand uh, doctors were preemptively captured. Uh, however, six died in the captivity. So you think that the 60 numbers maybe is a big, it's a relatively small number, but actually it constitutes around 10% of the total populations uh, in New Zealand. So I think that can cause one of the alarm uh, in, for, for having these uh, endangered species to be harmed by the oil. As such, also over 2,000 seabird carcasses have been recovered. And the success was built on the multi-year preparedness effort by Maritime New Zealand's and Mesa universities. How is it so? So I think just give, give you a background information. The wildlife response uh, is fully integrated into New Zealand oil spill contingency planning. And the mobilization of the wildlife response in this, I think, Rina incidents will be actually shortly only after the ship was grounded. So I think by day one, the information gathering, assessments of the spill site of the vessels, or uh, even mobilization of the equipment, or wildlife equipment has started. And by day two, I think there are actually few teams being mobilized to go for search and rescue, or even for collections of oil wildlife uh, in the region. And 
the oil wildlife facilities has also been mobilized or at least to step up. So all the facilities, be it permanent or temporary, has been identified in the plan. And from the day of mobilization, I think simultaneously, recognizances and collections of the data, few team being sent out to uh, do surveys and to do uh, collections of activities and also the setup of the uh, wildlife facilities has been uh, at least simultaneously concurrently being activated. So by day three, the wildlife facilities are ready to take in the oil animals and the first oil bird has been emitted. So as you can see that with such a large or huge demand on the logistical uh, requirements, I think MNZ, I think in terms of the, the, the mobilizations, uh, I think and escalations procedure-wise, they have did it and do together to handle the oil spill incidents at the same time. So I think that caused the first, I think that caused the success to the uh, wildlife response, I think all wildlife response. So it's something that for you to take you note know, that I think that is important that people actually know what they are doing and the resources are already readily available when in times of need. I think with that, uh, we can dive in into what are the wildlife response strategies. But before that, I have one small activities for everyone. So I have these three pictures, uh, they actually individually, I mean, they represent a different kind of wildlife strategies in, uh, for you to match the pictures to their corresponding wildlife response strategies. So I have Rachel that will put up a poll that you will see this into these three areas, which is the primary, secondary, and tertiary. So with now, I think, please cast your votes to think what is picture A that match to? Is it a primary, secondary, or tertiary? Or B is a primary, or B is a secondary? Or even C to you is a tertiary, secondary, or primary? So please, can I have your votes in? So far, I only have one participant, so the rest are able to do. Rachel, I see that the poll has ended. Is, is it intentional? Um, no, actually, it ended by itself, but let me just launch it again. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, yes. Okay, okay. let me relaunch it. Thank you. All right. Now, thanks, everyone. So I need your... Your contributions help me to cast your votes again. Yeah, I can see the votes are coming in. Just make a guess on how are these pictures match to the response uh, strategies. I'll give a few more minutes, maybe one more minute to go. I have over 50% of percent of 50% of participation rate. So I just need a few more to, to cast your books and see if you get it correct. Okay, we can count them down. Maybe five, four, three, two. Last chance to get your votes in. And make sure you can end the vote and the polling. Sorry. Thank you. So I think you can see the results. So let me just have zero. We have a few different choices. 
So most of them voted for the third one, tertiary, primary, and secondary. I also have other choice on primary, secondary, tertiary, secondary, tertiary, and primary. So I think the actual uh, answer is the majority win. So the first one is actually for tertiary. B, it's primary, and C will be secondary. So let me explain what are these three strategies actually about. So I think for primary, you can see that I think we always want to keep the oil away from the animals. That's always the primary strategies. So how can we do so? It's actually by oil spill response measures, which is means that you want to control the 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 the, the so, I mean the oil from at the source. So you do source control, uh, or in terms of what, the area of the it it is built like the offshore, uh, SE container and recovery strategies to prevent the oil from spreading or cross contaminations into other areas or be the shoreline. So I think the first we are looking to the corner response and uh, at the most initial part will be the source controls or then slowly you build up to what are the different strategies to keep the oil away from the animals. Definitely you want to do surveillance and monitoring to see what are the oil being, what are the oil wildlife being impacted and where are they impacted? Uh, so to what extent uh, they are impacted? So this is done under the primary side to get information and data collections. So I think that's uh, what the just now the MNZ or the RENA spill uh, is about. So the day one, they start on data collections. Since day one, they start on the data collections and information gathering. So for part two is on the secondary. So you keep the animals away from oil. So through the hazings and uh, deterrents, also by displacement, which means that preemptive captures. And third will be the tertiary, which is to mitigate the impacted the mitigate the impact on the oil animals so that that will include the capture and rehabilitations. So we will cover each strategies and the subsequent slides. So as I mentioned uh, about the primary to keep the oil away from the animals, so the surveillance and monitoring. So who will you want to get involved for the data collections? So for sure, you want to have the wildlife response experts, the taxonomic experts, the local biologies, or reporting from the infield uh, response operations. And you want to identify the species at risk or the real-time location of wildlife, sensitive habitats, or the seasonal variabilities, as I just now mentioned, the nesting. So I think this is uh, important, and it can be concurrent uh, when you, the, I would say that IMT sends people for, I think, shoreline or for the sketch shoreline cleanup assessment techniques to survey the shoreline, what is the impact to the shoreline. So at the same time, I think you also can have a, a, a task force or a task team to work together with these sketch team people to get, uh, to get your wildlife response experts inside the sketch team people to do the survey at the same time. So you actually can uh, consolidate the efforts rather than you need to request it separately or you don't know when to put your request forward. So it's important that you actually have a group of people to also uh, mention on all wildlife response in your incident management team. So I think this, all these can be collated and also be consolidated effort to, to concurrently uh, when they handle an oil spill. So secondary will be to keep the animal away from the oil, just now we mentioned about some hazing and deterrence methods. So it's actually a controlled disturbance to deter wildlife from contaminated or at risk areas. So, but you have to keep in mind that uh, the hazing and deplacements are not a silver bullet because its effectiveness can be limited and can decrease over time with habituations. So the birds is always, or the, the animals sometimes will just get habitual and they will just keep on revisiting the same place over and over again. So once you only do hazing one time, but over the time, I think the, the birds or the wildlife will just keep coming back to the same spot, then they, they, they get used to the noise, get used to the 
the lights that you actually use to deterrence or to disturb them. I think from there, I think the effectiveness can be uh, limited already. So regular monitoring and of the effectiveness is the key. If not managed properly, uh, it, uh, you have to manage properly because also you do not want to guide the birds into the odd areas. So all these will have to be trained or uh, the noise uh, introduced has to be at a certain control as well. You do not want to damage or uh, to cause harm to the animals as well. So depending on the habit uh, tax and the species, uh, hazing and deterrence may not be a viable response at all. Or uh, if the species are very susceptible to uh, stress, so once you disturb them, or they cannot react properly to stress, it may, may cause them to, to suffer and in the end uh, eventually die of the stress. So these are decisions I think not made lightly. So you require expert knowledge or even lessons learned that can be brought into play. So huge logistical undertaking, also the chance for some animals may die. So just to be uh to be careful that all these should seek, I think the wildlife experts uh I'll say that advice and to see whether for different type of species, I think different methods will be used altogether. And moving on to the tertiary response. So it involves a variety of response actions that span from the field to facility activities with the intention of releasing healthy, viable individuals back into the wild populations. So it is important to understand the resources required to be successful. So in terms of the personnel, uh, in terms of the equipment and facilities, or the time actually we are given to. So you can see that it's from the field ops. I think the activities here would be the capture of the live uh, or animals, collection or evaluations of the dead animals. You need people to transport from the field sites to the facilities. And you may want to set up a few stabilization stations in between if it is too far from the facility site. Or then moving on to the when they reach the facilities, you want to take on the intake and emissions. So every odd wildlife should be registered, given a number, have their own record, then before they move into the pre-care, uh, pre-wash care, or the animal care supports, then when they are really strong enough to at least endure the cleaning, which includes washing, rinsing, and drying uh, over several times, be before they actually can do to pre-release care or do the conditioning to get back uh, to their healthy state, and lastly, to release them back to the wild populations and we'll do a post-release monitoring. So all this process needs time, and yeah, in the average, we're looking about two to three weeks per animal. Uh, definitely, it will depends on the type of animals, uh, type of species we are handling, or the conditions of the wildlife uh, at that moment or at their state. So these actually are often uh, underestimated and require pre-planning. So you can see that there's a huge uh, logistical demand to just when you take in uh, the odd wildlife. And another part or a bit sensitive is the triage and the euthanasia. So triage, as I mentioned, is to prioritizing treatment of animal can be based on the resource limitations because you only have this limited uh, facilities or the equipments that you can treat the animals. So you will need to prioritize what the species to get treated first. So usually it will be either by the endangered species and the likelihood of the survivor or to support the populations. So in the sense that you look into their age, the reproductive status or sex. So in many of times, I think uh, they will prioritize to treat the adults over the young because I think there's higher chance for the adult to survive compared to the young and the adult are actually uh, ready for the, for the reproductions or reproductive stage. So euthanasia will be the act of inducing death in a dignified and humane manner with minimum of 
pain, fear, or distress to the animals involved. So this will be under part of triage, which is critical to the herd health. Um, this, I would say that it's part of triage, but it's not limited to the only triage. It's actually being evaluated at every stage, be it whether at the, the, I would say that the pre-care, or even go to the cleaning, or even up to the, uh, I would say that post uh, cleaning, where you need to monitor whether what is their survival rate. So I think euthanasia is also been evaluated throughout the stage for, I think, um, many uh, oil, in the, I mean, I'll say that been written in many oil wildlife plants, but these are some things to get consensus and agree with the response teams or even the government wildlife agencies. So that should be detailed in your national plans on the use of euthanasia as an option. So some, I think, uh, countries really have this in place. So when in times uh, this happened, then the vet or the trained uh, personnel will know what to do and they are authorized to do it. So all these will be recorded and it should not be taken lightly, I would say that. But if there's a policy in place, it will help things easier rather than you decide on the spot itself. So I've covered the three response strategies. If you can remember the three, so it's the primary, secondary, and tertiary. So definitely we want to prevent the oil to get to the animals. And secondary, you want to prevent the animal from getting to the oil. And third, if they're really impacted, so what are the mitigation uh, measures to take care of the oil wildlife? Moving on to critical components of a wildlife response. I think there are several factors that you can see here. Definitely first is you want to talk into the health and safety which you want to protect the people from getting hurt or hurting the oil and vulnerable oil wildlife. So do you have actually a safety plan in place? Uh, appointed safety officers, are the people trained to do what they're supposed to do? Uh, then do you provide the training and do you provide the appropriate PPE to protect the people? Then secondly will be the documentations. I think good documentations is important be it for the compensations or the future studies or investigations. So it can be in the form of paper or electronic uh, records. This is often, uh, I would say that people find it tedious and, but it's a very crucial, uh, I would say that steps that you need to do because many of times people want to learn back from the past uh, histories or past uh, lessons learned or at the same time, when it comes to a dispute, all these documentations will become in handy in terms of what the decisions made. Why do you actually what kind what in what basis you make all these decisions? Have it been recorded? Has it been discussed? So good housekeeping of the documentations is important for the dispute, be it for the authorities, for the organizations, or even with the public duty questions. And lastly, I think the communications. So strong and smooth communication is crucial with the stakeholders involved. So internal for efficient response, external for reassurance and the reputations of the company. As you can see, I think uh, the bottom left pictures, there's actually some setup on the lighting, people are getting interviewed. So this is actually a real, uh, I think, examples. It's a CNN uh, reporters to check out Think the Nakonda, the Deep Water Horizons uh, response. So the IB, uh, media have been invited to view and to understand the rehab process and up-to-date progress on the oil wildlife response. So this is important as you know, nowadays uh, anyone can post anything on the social media, be it Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and people may interpret the message wrongly. So rather than the waiting for the media just to interpret by the pictures, so it's good for the responding party to invite the media from time to time to, to give them a good view on what's been uh, done on site. And this can prevent any misunderstandings or, or outrage by the public or the responding party not, not doing anything. So rather be open, be honest, and also to, to be well informed for the public is important to, when managing any response be it on wildlife or on the street uh, handling. 
In terms of the oil wildlife uh, response facilities, there are, I think, a variety of accepted approaches. So, but it all required pre-planning. So delay in the establishments can lead to increase in mortalities. So a plan for the rapid establishments of a temporary or identifying a permanent facilities is a critical element for any response plan. So in, in terms of uh, the permanent facilities, you can look into is, the, is a purpose built for oil wildlife or is adaptable for oil wildlife. Example, you have in the country, there's wildlife rehabilitation facilities that can be used. Then in terms of temporary facilities, we are looking to building of opportunities like a warehouse or temporary structures, the Mackie tent. So all these will need to source for the, I think, your vendors, your suppliers and in the peacetime. So in the actual, your incident management teams will just need to take out the list of, I think, resources or the, the contact numbers. They can just make a call and mobilize the necessary suppliers to form this temporary or even give a call for the permanent facility that you say that you want to step up the facility to handle oil wildlife. So I think that will require all the pre-planning. And the requirement for the establishments also includes big space. So to actually house them before, during, and after cleaning, rinsing, and the drying uh, process. And you have need to have the conditioning pools before release, and therefore you would have the access to the water, electricity, and gas. Good ventilations and proper waste management are also important. So, in terms of be it for the waste of the animals uh, or handling the oil wildlife animals, so in the biohazards, kind of the equipment, the strings and needles, feeding tubes. Uh, and it should be separated out from your normal other waste. So your, your waste can be a human waste of the PPEs, of the, of the food waste that uh, you will need to take care of. So all these should be segregated properly. And set up security to ensure minimum uh, disturbance to the oil, wildlife and also to safeguard the response personnel. So in many times, I think uh, people have high tensions on the oil, wildlife. The public may be concerned, they want to visit, but they do not know that they may disturb the uh the wildlife because in, in times like this, they are usually very stressed, and any kind of noise may add further stress to all these uh, wildlife. So it's important that you keep it in a very peaceful, very calm environment uh, in order to aid in the root corporations or to get back the health uh, for the wildlife. I think the last part is looking into the planning for an oil, uh, wildlife response. So it's important that uh, we look into the oil, wildlife uh, response preparedness. So what we did just now or what we share about strategies, what are the critical components during a response is what we do during response. But do you actually have the trained people? Do you have the facility and the equipment? to prepare you for, to handle such uh, oil, wildlife response, I think it comes into the investment in preparedness. So it's critical to the success as, as we already mentioned that there's huge logistical demands and short window of opportunities to successfully capture, rehabilitate and release wildlife after oiling. Sometimes, as I mentioned, the number one complex problem will be the wildlife will not know that you're actually helping them they cannot communicate with you. So the oil animals, if you're not able to identify them and to capture them, to send them to the facilities, you may actually fly to another region to cross-contaminate in the shoreline or other species uh, during the, I think the, during the course that you are, they, are, they escape from you. However, I think you need trained people or experts to help you to identify the distress, I think, uh, I think features that they have, as you um, as if you recall, there are several types of how the oil can get into the animals. I think first is very visual, which is smoldering effect on the fur or the feathers of the oil wildlife. But if they actually like oiling, like they going through inhalations or ingestions, there's something that you cannot see, which you would need the wildlife experts to really identify the irrational. 
uh, behavioral of the wild uh, of the animals. I think that would be crucial to to identify that uh, that they may be the species that need help, or the in return they maybe have uh, already contacted the oil or ingested the oil that will will need some uh, I think medical care. So the all wildlife response plan provides a roadmap for people to follow through the response. So a successful and effective response will depend on the competent personnel working to a well-developed plan that has been adequately resourced and regularly exercised. So the some questions for you here will be, do you have actually an all wildlife plan? Do you actually have enough or the response capability in terms of personnel, equipment, and facilities? So these are some questions that you need to think about. And if you do not have it, I think it's time for you to, to start to develop one and integrate into your, uh, be it your corporate or the national oil contingency plan. I think with that, I think some key aways for these sessions will be oil wildlife response is an integral part of oil spill preparedness and response. And there's a brief window for success. So initiate the response early, just like the RINA uh, case studies. They actually initiate from day one. Then the complexity of oil wildlife is often uh, underestimated because the logistical demands and the attentions on the public and the media for the company to handle. And lastly, I think it requires development of partners through exercises and training and the engagement with all stakeholders. So with that, I think this is the end of my presentations for oil wildlife response. So yeah. back to you, uh, Sharina. Thanks, Prihong. Um, yeah, I think I have a, just a quick question for you. So I think if I recall many years ago, the concept of wildlife response, um, at least in Asia, is still very was very much still like a novel idea. Um, but I can see that it has gained, slowly gained a higher priority over the years. Um, I think what do, my question would be, what do you think is sort of like the biggest challenge when it comes to oil wildlife response in this region, like, you know, at the current moment, for example? Mm. Uh, it's a good question. So I think I never can emphasize <laughs> the, the message that I have talk through during the presentations, I think one important part will be the oil wildlife response plan. Um, many organizations, in fact, they do not have it uh, in their oil spill contingency planning. Uh, I think good examples will be in terms of what they have integrated into their oil spill contingency plan is the New Zealand. I think another country will be Australia. So mm. it's, I think, uh, mandatory for the organizations to include oil wildlife response plan into the uh, uh, OSCPs or the OPEC. I think Australia is known as OPEC, the Oil uh, Pollution Emergency Plan. So I think once they make it, I would say that be better compulsory or their high awareness to incorporate oil wildlife response plans, I think this will, will help or will gain the awareness for many organizations to take notice of the huge logistical demands, be it the trained personnel, uh, the facilities that is required, the big space just now we talk about, mm -hmm. uh, and as well as the, I think the last the equipments, both all these require specialized equipments, um, special trained people to handle oil animals. It will be another skill set apart from handling oil itself. Mm, okay, thank you so much, Pihang. I think that's a really interesting session. Um, so I think to all participants, if you have any questions, do not wait till the plenary session. It will be addressed um, primarily in the plenary, plenary session, but uh, do type your questions in um, as early as now or anytime during the presentations. Okay, um, so we are actually fully utilizing uh, Hui Huang's expertise for today's webinar. Um, so the second presentation um, is also going to be uh, by her, um, but her topic now will be about um, oil spill risk assessment. Okay. Uh, we'll just give her a couple of uh, seconds or a minute to just, um, you know, drink up some water and then she will proceed with her session. But uh, for the rest of you, can you please uh, check your chat box? Um, we have already shared the link to the attendance and feedback form. 
So you can indicate on the attendance form whether you require an um, electronic certificate. So we request the participants to complete and submit the form to us after the webinar. Okay. So we hold over to you whenever you are ready. Thank you, Sharina. So just let me share my slides. So welcome back. It's me again. So it's not deja vu. It's not going back to oil wildlife response, but we have another topic, which is the oil spill risk assessment. Don't worry about that. It's totally a separate one. You will not get confused. I will say that the topics will be very different and the concepts we are talking about is will be uh will be. I would say that, mm, yeah, it will be different. But I think oil spilled uh, risk assessment, I think is, it gives you an even more way back um, to, to, to the fundamentals, to where we should do beginning, what are the focus that we should have. So I think oil wildlife response also can, is also form part, I think, uh, of it when we do our oil spill risk assessment. So welcome back to the second sessions by myself on talking about oil spill risk assessment. So just want to be sure that you're able to see my share slides. Can give me a thumbs up. Thank you. Okay, I can see. So I shall begin without further ado. So for the next 40 minutes, uh, we'll be looking into the oil spill risk assessment. So what would I want to achieve for these sessions? I think there's, I think what first part is to understand where uh, OSTRA, which is the oil spill risk assessment, lies in the context of planning process. Second part, you want to understand the overall process uh, and steps of the oil spill risk assessment. So the first part, the planning process, it is the question always begin with, how prepared are you to handle a spill? So just now, this is also the formula that will never go wrong, that you should actually keep it to heart. And a successful and effective response will depend on the competent personnel working to well-developed plans uh, that has been adequately resourced and regularly exercised. So there are many components. You can see that it's the four components to, to make the success, uh, to make an effective response, uh, be when you handle the spill and the oil wildlife response. So this is the planning process. So you can see the fact from the developed scenarios to develop of the response strategy. So your oil wildlife response strategy actually is in the second part. So the first part, the OSTRA actually comes before even you develop the response strategies. Then moving on to determine the response capabilities put into your contingency plan preparations. Then you, with the plan, you conduct the uh, co-training as well as exercises to make sure people know what are their roles and responsibilities. Do you have enough equipment to station there? Then lastly, to review and update. So I would say that even OSTRA is forms at the beginning because you need to develop your scenarios. You want to know what is the oil spill risk that's involved. But I will say that this process or oil spill uh, risk assessment process should be doing or should be revisit in every component be it when you develop response strategies, determine response capabilities. Because any change to your oil spill risk, which is, means that maybe change in the operations, change in the situations, change in maybe your assets, or even if you change in personnel, that will cause you to revisit uh, or to reevaluate the oil spill risk assessment. So I think that's a very brief and uh, broad definition. So moving on to the process, there are seven steps, as you can see now, and it's also in a continuous improvement loop. So this is a 
developed by the guidelines from the Joint Industrial Project. Uh, so there are the steps listed down for seven steps. So first one, to establish the context. So this is where the purpose of the risk assessment to cover the extent of the whether per project or per organizations or the, pe the people conducting the RA will be identified as well as the methodological uh, G to conduct this uh, RA. Second will be the hazard identifications. You know that identification by maybe site audits or even by your operations. Uh, using different kind of uh, tools, which we'll we discuss. Third, likelihood analysis. So with the, the hazard being identified, you want to know what's the likelihood that these hazards can happen. Uh, what is the probability of the spill occurring? Then fourth, we'll lead into what, so what is the consequence uh, in these aspects? So if it happens, so we have to determine the risk by calculation for maybe the modeling results or even by the sensitivities or the resources at risk in your regions and to give a, I would say the value to what is the severity of this impact. Fifth will be to establish and evaluate the risk. So the risk come from, later you will know that is there something about the risk matrix tables, is the likelihood versus the uh, consequence. You want to rank the risk identified against the risk metric. So either it can be a client specific or a general, or even it's a national uh, effort or a national uh, indicators. So for the risk reductions uh, on number six, it will be to identifications or the approach to reduce the risk. So we have your risk being identified, be it whether now you know that you rank in terms of high, medium, low. So do you actually wants to drive or you have to drive the high to the medium, the medium to the low, or the low remain low. So the last part will be the input to the oil spill planning. Um, Richard, I don't need the whole now, this for later. Yeah. So there's the last part will be the input to oil spill response planning where I think what's the information gathered from the process and fit into the overall planning process as you can see that it will need to the next stage to develop the uh, response strategies, to identify what is the response capabilities. So I think the last part will be the uh, information that will be gathered and fit to the, the outside this loop for continuous uh, improvement. So let's begin with the first step. So how we actually establish the context of the assessment that you guess you can see, break down to objectives, scope, methods, boundaries, and risk tolerance criteria. So the C's criteria. So I think the main objective of conducting the offshore is to determine the onshore or the offshore activities or both. They are in line with the corporate risk tolerance. So this is achieved by identifying, categorizing, or evaluating, and lastly presenting the risk. So other objectives also can be used to support for decisions making, or is, is it a basis for approval by regulatory uh, authorities, or is a basis for stakeholders' communications? So I think it depends on what is the, the objective. But the main thing is definitely for this is to determine the offshore activities or onshore activities that, are, that will be in line with your corporate risk tolerance. For scope-wise, I think, is really to identify and evaluate the risk to the environment from the accidental oil spills. So the environment, we are looking into the ecological and social economic factors. So it can be beneficial to communicate with the relevant stakeholders to ensure the scope of assessments meets the needs of both the operators and the relevant stakeholders. The method adopted will be from the best practice and also the industrial practice in the geographical uh, region and also the regulatory uh, regime. For the, I think for next will be the boundary. So you want to what to be included or not included in this assessment. If not, I think the whole world is your boundary. So you want to limit the, to what is being related for this assessment. In this case, will be the oil spill, maybe limited to your area of operations or what is the time of your maybe your campaign 
So all this is the boundary that you will need to set for your assessments. And last is the risk uh, tolerance criteria, which means that the risk level should be measured against the ecological and social economic risk tolerance criteria. So it's actually defined by the maximum likelihood of a certain consequence, which is tolerable for the operating companies. So I think with that, then you establish your step ones to uh, define the context of the assessment. After, after which, I think that you will lead to a series of the key questions. So what can go wrong and lead to the potential release of oil? How likely are the identified scenarios? And what happens to the spilled oil? What are the key environmental receptors? What is the risk of the environmental damage? And lastly, how is the established risk utilized in oil spill response planning? All these questions you will be guided and you see that how it will lead to the, the step seven. So step two, you will once you set the context, you will want to identify what is the hazards. Okay? So it's stated with the facilities and operations. So I think hazards, as we all know, is anything that can is a potential to cause harm. So you want to study what can cause harm to your facilities and operations. So what are the threats or even the circumstances which may trigger hazardous events? So you want to identify the potential characteristics of the hazardous events and uh, identify potential preventive measures. So I think potential characteristics may be is it the offshore activities or is it the onshore activities? So what is inside your facilities? Is it the terminals and uh, ports? Or maybe it's the offshore rig platforms or the, or the well hit platforms. So do you have the vessels that's traveling on FPSOs, collisions, pipeline leakage? So all these activities that can lead to oil spill, it will be considered one of your potential uh, uh, hazards identifications. So you can see that on the right, you have actually the pictures on all the offshore activities in uh, the SC. So you can break into, I think, the step-by-steps. So just as mentioned, if, example, you have a port or terminal activities, you want to list out any scenarios that can lead to oil spill. Then after which we want to have deep dive into the details, examples, what kind of oil we are looking into, uh, what is the quantity likely to, to spill in the worst case scenarios, and what is the characteristic of oil? Is it uh, very persistent or is it a very heavy oil? Uh, so all this should be, I would say that document down. And lastly, if the oil spill were to happen, what would be the resources at risk in your nearby regions? So you look into the environmental and social economic or cultural factors. So some tools that can help you is the, the hazards and operability studies, which is the HESOP, HESIT, which is the hazard identifications, or even the failure mode effect analysis, uh, the existing data that can help you to identify uh, the hazards in your region or the area of operations. So the output is to list out the hazards, but you will exclude the likelihood or the probability or the consequence at this stage first. So you just list out any or every type of hazards that, that associate with your operations or facilities. So after which then we will, uh, I would say that, do the likelihood and the consequence in the subsequent step. So how you need to document it, so you can actually use a spreadsheet for the ease of reporting, reference, or sorting out. So one example that I think I will show you here is for just for illustration purpose. So some activities that's at, happening at sea, which is the shipping activities, oil spill aspirations and productions. Um, perhaps there are some in inland facilities like the oil terminals, ports, etc. using the map that is on the right. Then you actually populate to the information just like I mentioned. So what kind of port or facility activities that happens in the region. So maybe there's an oil storage and distribution. So that's the purpose. Then what's the possible oil spill scenarios? Well, because you have uh, vessels to come for unloading, loading. So they may be 
uh, has a chance for vessel collisions and the tank may breach and resulted into the loss of product in the tank. So what kind of oil has been released? Maybe it's a light oil, a gasoline, diesel, bunker oil, or even the marine diesel oil. Then what are the volume that we're looking into? Perhaps give an a estimate what is the tank capacities or what's the most case scenarios that you can have. Then what are the characteristics and other informations? Like, is it a continuous? Uh, because maybe only one tank is breached, but the other tank is unstable and may breach any time. Or actually when the vessel collisions, it actually hit the pipelines beneath and there's a chance that there will be a, the, the leakage for the pipelines. So all these, you can actually put it in. Then the location and that long that's important so that certain at the later part, you can do a modeling uh, trajectory to see where if it were to leak, then where will be the movement of oil. And lastly, you want to know what is the environmental and social economic sensitivities nearby, whether you actually, I think many times I've heard that this fisheries is very important in this region. Uh, there are any other important fisheries uh, around your facilities or operations that you need to take note of, or maybe are other ports and terminals also the nearby regions that can affect their uh, operations as well. So it's good that you actually document down or be using a spreadsheet or any form of uh, I'll say data management. So with the hazard being identified, you can look into the likelihood and any consequence because uh, you will know that actually risk is actually measured against with likelihood and consequence. So the number sector three will be on the likelihood analysis. So what we are talking about likelihood analysis. So likelihood is actually what's the chance of hazard events happening. So what are the chances? It's just like hmm, in being that region you will give in terms of uh, vessel collisions. So what are the chances that you will have vessel collisions in your operations or your facilities? So it can be based on statistics, which is quantitative, and also qualitative will be based on the experience for relevant historical events. So quantitative will be moving into numbers, looking to details. Qualitative maybe will be lesser, but I think it will be related more to uh, experience or even in these regions, the local knowledge or even the industry, uh, I think uh, experts, not industry experts, industry experts as well as this industry of all others like collections from other uh, companies. So that can be also relevant uh, to help you in your risk assessments. So lastly, I think you want to establish relationship between your current operations to the livelihood. So I think some data you can use is maybe the oil spill data or even the failure and accidents data that you want to, 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 to collect or to get hold of before you want to establish the livelihood or like be it in the, your organization, if you have uh, organizations in other regions do other regions also have such uh, incidents happening with pipeline uh, leakage, uh, tank explosions, uh, vessels collisions in their regions? So all these you will need to have some data gathering before to make your, I will say that analysis on what is the likelihood that this hazard may happen to. So the likelihood of an event uh, and the potential quantity of discharged hydrocarbons are the two main parameters contributing to the risk from an event. So an assessment should be undertaken to select those events uh, to be taken forward in the Austria and to define the oil spill scenarios to be modeled. So in this sense that I think to put into perspective will be like, uh, if a, it's a spill condition I mentioned, so there's a breach of, the, the tank can be the valve, there's valve to even be shut off, then maybe the maximum uh, leakage will be, I'll say that 100 ton or 100 barrels, because I think the valve can immediately shut off, the e, uh, ESD can immediately shut off uh, within one second, I think by the standards. Then the minimum leakage from the pipe will be only like 100 barrels, as compared to maybe uh, vessel collisions that the tank has breached, cannot control, and 
maybe it depends on the tank capacities, thousands, ten thousands of uh, tons of oil has been leaked into the environment. So it, compared from a hundred barrels to ten thousand metric tons, you will see you will want to prioritize that you know the the heavier or I mean the large quantity of oil can actually uh or probably that happen on Cambridge can be you need to evaluate on certain oil spill scenarios that you will need to be modeled. But being said that, I'm not saying that you want to rule out that the, the scenarios that only can cost 100 barrels. So in the discussion-wise, all scenarios will have to be listed down. But in terms of your risk assessments, you will want to focus on a certain uh, highly, uh, I would say that, probable uh, likelihood to happen uh, oil spill scenarios to be modeled or to be in, in further uh, I would say that discussed and have put in place the preventive or mitigation uh, measures to it. So in this sense, all events will have to be, uh, I would say that brainstorm being listed, but those potentially have a significant contribution to the risk should be considered and have uh, defined the oil spill scenarios to be modeled. So I would say that including those likelihood, uh, low likelihood, but may have high severities. So example, if I say that 100 barrels, it's the, it's the small. So I think in terms of, the, I would say that you can compare 100 barrels and 10,000 barrels, you want to focus on 10,000 barrels. But if this 100 barrels is always like, maybe happen like every, every month, the frequency is like every month or likelihood that it happens is very high, then you want to actually put inside in your oil spill uh, risk assessment. So sometimes I would say that I will say that uh, the double hit, uh, I will say that double H swords where we each, you can see that small quantity, but it always have uh, always frequently happened, you want to actually consider. And sometimes like this it's um low likelihood, but you have a high impact. Example, the unlikely the, the tank will breach and then unlikely there will be explosions, then you don't want to consider which is which is wrong because even though it's unlikely that you can have explosions, but the impact is great, you will actually need to consider. So all events here I think should be considered uh and for the likelihood analysis. So nothing should be ruled out, and you will be up to the organizations or the stakeholders together to discuss what should be included and what should be given for the mitigations uh, uh, measures. So the aim of the selection process is ultimately to provide a risk basis for oil spill response. So with that, I think we will move into the consequence analysis. So the consequence of the oil spill to the resources at which so resources at which just now we mentioned this logical, ecological or environmental. So you want to see whether there's the bird colony, any sensitive uh, shorelines, be mangrove, mud floods, uh, mud flat, a uh, mud sorry, mud flats, or even the rocky shores. Then second will be the social economic uh, activities, maybe it be the ports, terminals, tourism, fish farm, fisheries. And lastly, consider the cultural, which is uh, the temple's place of worships. So these are the factors that you want to, to, to consider that which is the resources at risk. So how you determine the consequence value, you require the estimations of the likely fate and the trajectory of spill oil through modeling and in the marine and the coastal areas. So you can see that the fate of oil, uh, it, if you are familiar, there's the weathering process, which means that once oil spilled into the environment, it, the evaporation can take place, emulsification may take place depending on the oil type, spreading uh, of the oil, uh, dispersion, degradation, sedimentations, or even the oxidations. So it will depend. So you want to do a modeling to see where is the movement of the oil that will go. So the general rule of time is being affected by the wind and the current, and we have those uh, software, oil, the oil trajectory software to model the direction of the oil that they may go uh, in a few days' time. And identifications of the environmental and social, uh, social economic resources, which in short, the resources at risk, 
will be all those potential environmental receptors. And lastly, to evaluate uh, evaluation of sensitivities of the environmental receptors and the identifications of those to be used as the impact indicators for determining of the consequence uh, values. We can see this chart here. So how we categorize of the resources at risk, it can be in two, three types. So biological, shoreline types, and social economic resources. So I think for the first, I think biological features will be those about their, the living resources and their uh, habitats, including the marine lives, uh, birds, mammals, which includes those endangered or protected species. Then the shoreline types is generally described in terms of their substrate, so sediment size and wave ex uh, exposure, so like sandy beach, rocky shores, uh, mangroves, uh, mud flats. And lastly, the sensitive social economic features. So this represents the human use resources and can include fisheries, um, and the be it whether fisheries, which is the, the commercial fishing, the harvesting, the fishing villages or even the aquaculture, tourism, and recreation areas and activities. So you can actually populate it into another, I would say that, uh, tables. And the consequence levels from very low uh, to extremes. So with the establishment of the livelihood and consequence, you are now able to establish and evaluate the risk, which is the main bulk that I'm going to talk about. So you will want to map the likelihood and consequence onto the risk table. So what is a risk uh, assessment metric? So it is a visual tool that can depict the potential risk affecting a business. So the risk metric is based on the two intersecting factors. So one is the likelihood and the other is the uh, severity, which is the consequence. Then in other words, I think it's a tool that can help you to visualize the probability versus the severity of a potential risk. So depending on the likelihood and severity, risk can be categorized as the high, medium, and low. So as part of the risk management process, I think companies use risk metrics to help them prioritize different risks and develop and appropriate uh, mitigation strategies. So it can be work. I mean, this risk metric can work in many forms. So be whether strategic, operationals, uh, financials, and externals. So it works by you can see that it's by a chart and the color code by the severity. So high risk you can see is in red. Then the medium risk would be the amber or orange, and the low risk usually in the yellow. So I think the color code is defined by the organizations. So no, no right or wrong. And every risk metrics have two axis. So one is to measure the likelihood and the other one is to measure the impact. So with whatever the parameters you set for the risk events the, on the likelihood and impact, the risk uh, assessment metrics will provide a quick snapshots on the threat landscape. So you will see for this risk or the hazards that you identified, where you will fall into high, medium, or the low risk category. So we look into what is the value or how should we tag along with the uh, likelihood. So you want to select an appropriate rating from A to E for each oil spill scenarios. So B, A can be, we never heard of E in the industry, so all the way E happen more than once per year at the locations. So this is, uh, you see these categories or these five categories are, are used or adopted by most companies. No, like I said, that is actually a discussion with your stakeholders. You do not need to stick to the A to E exactly like it is. It will actually depend on the, the, I would say the needs or the operations uh, requirements uh, or the setting for your organizations. So with that, I think prior you collect or you want to give uh, indications that if it's never heard in the industry, do you want to take a percentage to it? Or maybe it's a highly un un unlikely kind of scenarios. Maybe it's a less than ten percent chance. So I think the the potential is an indicative. So, like I mentioned, always 
is always a consensus with your stakeholders. So be heard of it in the industries, or you say that it is maybe unlikely that it will happen. So first, be highly unlikely. Second, B can be just the unlikely, which is heard of it in the industry. Do you want to tap a percentage to it? Maybe more than more than ten percent, less than forty percent or thirty percent. It happened in your organization more than once or per year, or or happened in your organizations or more than once per year in your industry. So you want to tap maybe okay, the C is the likely or possible to happen. Then you can give a tap off. 40% to 60%, 40% to 50%, then you're moving on to the next one, it's uh, likely to happen at the locations or more than once per year in the organizations. Do you want to give a higher percentage range? And lastly, happen more than once per year at the location, giving a, this possible is a highly likely to happen. What is the percentage that to the organization is considered as highly likely? It, above 80%, above 90%, so some things to be agreed upon. Then you, you will select from A to E. Same to uh, the consequence analysis. You want to change another indicator, maybe it's one to five. So one will be a slight impact to all the way extensive international impact. So select an appropriate, so it's one to five. So the factors to consider will be any biological sensitivity nearby, just like I didn't mention the three factors. So do we have the seabirds? Is it a turtle nesting areas? Um, this all this will be you will be considered to the population sensitivities to disturbance. Also, you will want to include the res resilience to oil pollutions and the ability to recover after oil pollutions. So the consequence is that whether your seabirds are in, are resilient to the oil pollutions and the ability to recover after the oil pollutions. Same with like the total nesting. So all these is like, then you tag and you consider and whether what is the impact and give a rating from one to five. For shoreline sensitivities, I think we are looking to like, what is the holding capacities for the oil? How effectively it is cleaned by the natural mechanisms? Or whether is it like, as compared to one example would be, would be the oil persistence on exposed high energy rocky shores versus the uh, I would say that mud flats or the marsh or the wetlands or mangroves. So I think the high energy rock rocky shores will be substantially I think less uh persistence for the oil than the I think the mud groves. Then lastly I think any social economic sensitivities nearby, and the fisheries, tourism, uh, water intakes, or ports and terminals that can affect the uh operations or other people's livelihood. So I think all these elements will be need to consider when you want to do the ranking for consequence uh, analysis. So with that, I think the establishment of the risk will be combining the likelihood value and the potential consequence of each scenarios. So this is a five by five, just now I didn't mention from A to E and one to five. So you can use other metrics if you want to expand to sub seven to nine to nine, but that will be, um, that will have, you have be more, I would say that defined indicators for your metrics. A uh, three by three is really used, not saying that uh, it's not possible, but because it will bring a lot of your risk into a high or medium or low. So having a more widespread uh, metrics will give you a better indications. So you identify the scenarios that is uh, low, medium, and high risk and can be a basis for prioritizing of the risk. Meaning, if the scenario and after you give the rating for to high, for sure you want to reduce the high into the medium range. Then from the medium to see whether you have any mitigation measures that you can move from medium to the low uh, risk regions. So whatever remain low should have continuous monitoring every year uh, for your risk assessment to make sure that it's maintained low. So anything that's high, definitely you want to see have additional controls, any mitigations uh, managers to bring it down to medium as much as possible or as low as reasonably uh, practicable. So I think that's the approach that we usually uh, use for risk assessment. But if it's a high, then definitely you have to educate the people what are the 
attritional controls in place so that people will get to know if the, the, the risk is not able to reduce and is essential for the operations to carry out. So the risk depends on the likelihood, how likely a uh, hazard events that can happen. So the consequence, just now we mentioned, consequence to the three factors, the resources at risk, or even to the volume of oil, the type of oil, it is more persistent than uh, heavy fuel oil, which is more persistent and the effect uh, may take longer to recover or, or the shoreline will be take a longer time to recover from the persistent oil over the light oil. Then others is also how prepared are you to combat the spill? Do you actually resources in the equipment or people trained to do the to handle the oil spill? Or even the season, uh, the migrations of the uh, shorebirds, the seabirds, or even the monsoon season, the northeast monsoon, southwest monsoon, do you have actually an impact on your region of interest? So we have one, I've explained on the, I think, in terms of do the hazard identifications. Then with that, you will develop your oil spill scenarios and you want to rate your oil spill scenarios uh, risk in terms of likelihood and the consequence which is the impact. Then you match against the risk metrics tables. So now is your turn. I have an example here. So based on the scenario provided below on the left side, which is the uh, example of the terminal operation, which is the oil storage and distributions, and there's a possibility of the vessel collisions as the oil spill scenarios. The type of bunker uh, oil release will be the bunker oil, and the volume is 1,500 1, metric ton. Characteristic is actually continuous after collisions. Then environmental and social economic sensitivities will be nearby ports and terminals and the fisheries. So with this information provided, just have a guess of do your own uh, risk assessment rating, what will be your risk rating be? So using this five by five on the right side, you have a, I think you have a, just consider the factors you have that I listed down here. How you would you rate the risk rating? Is it a high, medium or a low? So I think with Rachel, uh, you can launch the poll now for people to put in their, Votes. Yes, so you will see the low, medium, high. So for these given scenarios and the data you have, how would you actually rate this risk? So there's no right or wrong test for these answers. I want to say just now, I think I I think many emphasis on it's always agreement by stakeholders. Then there are actually other information that you want to collect from uh from the uh thing um the operation itself, but just based on these scenarios, what for you, how would you rate this risk? Is it a high, medium, or a low? So don't worry that uh, there's no answer, I would say that there's no right or wrong answer for this, but it's just for you, as you go through these risk assessment activities, how would you yourself will view these hazards or view these oil spill scenarios? You can just make a guess. So I have three uh, participants. Answered. Some people will read it as a high and some read it as a medium. I think Rachel, it is again being ended. The poll is ended. So do you want to reopen again?
yeah, the, keep the the votes coming in. So I now have on pause some view as high. Half fifty percent of the answered participants have high and medium. Any other more? So we have more high now than medium. Let's give give a few more minutes for more to participate. Okay, then we can count it down to 10 more seconds. Okay, we can end up calling now. So thank you for those participants. So we have the votes on um, eight of uh, five. Actually, view it as a high risk and three view it as a medium risk. Uh, it mentions that um, there's no right or wrong. So I think we can revisit one slide before this. Yep. So I think we're talking about the risk depends on the likelihood consequence. So with that, if you want to read from the likely that you will have the events that taken place in your organizations that you actually heard of, vessel collision is common, and you can hear from the news, have been the oil spill incidents is constituted to the uh the vessel collisions, the shipping incidents. So I think you will probably that maybe the likelihood that will give a it higher, then the impact maybe at your regions uh. 1500 uh, compared to uh, the oil, maybe for this instance, can it is uh, a bunker fuel, maybe it's a less persistent oil, then you feel that the consequence is not as uh, uh, severe as compared to maybe the HFOs. Then you are nearby, I think the ports and terminals, uh, or you have the, I think, resources already in hand at your area. So once it happens, you're able to deploy the resources and help it out. So you you may view your uh I would say the impact on severities to be lower. So that gives you maybe a moderate impact that you do not need uh that you're able to handle within local uh I think resources that you would say that is the tier one, tier two, tier three resources. So in all, there's no right or wrong. So for those people who actually view it as a high risk or you think that it's have high impact and high uh severity, uh high likelihood and in pack, so you want to bring it down to the medium and later to the low risk. So I hope that everyone has a at least a good idea. So with the hazard identifications, you do your likelihood and consequent analysis that match it up with a risk metric table. And last two components with the risk reductions that I will go through, I think quite briefly. So as mentioned, what you want to do, how you actually can reduce the risk will be either reduce the likelihood or you reduce the consequence uh, to the event. So I think you want to introduce the mitigating measures, see whether you can actually push down to the uh, to a lower risk, or you're looking into the hierarchy of control, elimination, substitutions, engineering controls, administrative controls, or last part is the PPE. So how to actually can introduce the mitigation measures to reduce the risk, the likelihood, uh, sometimes uh, if you're able to uh, prevent it from happening, yeah, you, you can't. So all this is the two factors because risk is measured against consequence and livelihood. So something for the, the, the organizations to look into. So for definitely from the high risk, you want to drive down to the medium and the medium to the low as much or as uh, low as reasonably practicable.
So some activities you will look into or the methodologies will be the preparedness and the response. Then also incorporate into your national and the regional OSP contingency plans. Uh, definitely regional corporations. So if you do have your own resources, do you actually have the nearby terminals and ports have it? Or even your nearby the rigs, uh, they actually have to do, uh, I think, collaborations or cooperatives. Or do you actually tier two resources or tier two organizations you can tap into? Like in uh, like Malaysia is the PMAC, Indonesia is the OSCTs, or subsequently, uh, uh, there are actually others kind of tier two organizations that you can tap onto, which is under the regional corporations. So that is you'll be looking into your risk reductions. I think lastly, how you put everything into uh, I think the real oil spill response planning. So I think with all the risks being identified, then what will happen? So example, the vessel collisions, you want to actually deploy booms. So do you actually have the, uh, I think the shoreline booms or being impacted in the shoreline booms or the offshore booms, you have the offshore booms at your place. So what kind of resources you want to, uh, I would say that equip with or to, to hold on to. So I think, it will come from your risk assessments. So for the risk assessments, you will know and you come about to do the selections of your response strategies. So I think with that, I think it comes to the end of my sessions. So in a nutshell, I just want to, I think the key important message is uh, it's always a continuous improvement for risk assessment. It should be, uh, I would say that assess and evaluate from time to time or there's a change in events or your operations mm -hmm. personnel. Yeah, which is very important. And lastly, how actually a very simple steps in how you do the risk rating, which is means that you will need to identify your hazards, then do a rating for likelihood and consequence with your to map, to map into the risk metrics tables. So important that do your organization or the national site have a risk tolerance criteria for you to do the comparisons or to do the risk uh, metrics mapping. And lastly, all these inputs can help you to decide in your future in terms of the develop of the response strategies as well as the subsequent, the, I would say that the resource capabilities to hold in your organizations. So I think with that, thank you for having me to present on both topics. I hope that, that these are very two different topics and you will learn uh, as a sub key message from, uh, from myself. Thank you. Thank so, back to you, Sharina. Thank you, Kui Huang. Um, we will proceed to the next presentation. Um, Pak Ondi is not able to join us. So, there is Ibu Sulastri who will be presenting a case study for us, um, case study in Indonesia. Um, Ibu Sulastri, are you able to share your slide and, if possibly, on your video? I'm aware that there are questions coming in for Pui Hang, so I'll get her to address these um, at the end during the plenary session. But just keep your questions coming in, yeah? Okay. Ibu uh, Sulastri, uh, to you, over to you. Selamat pagi. Baik. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi. Salve. Shalom. Om Swastiastu. Namo Buddhaya. Salam sehat dan salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Uh, sebelumnya, sebelumnya saya uh, menyampaikan permohonan maaf. Harusnya pada pagi hari ini uh, materi penanggulangan pencemaran dan perusakan lingkungan laut di Provinsi Nusa Tenggara Timur harusnya e, dibawakan oleh Bapak Kepala Dinas Provinsi Kepala Dinas Lingkungan Hidup dan Kehutanan Provinsi Nusa Tenggara Timur Bapak Ondisia Gian 
Namun ada satu dan lain hal, maka saya ditugaskan untuk uh, mengikuti uh, apa membawakan materi ini. dan lainnya dapat menggunakan replacement cost method. Dan yang terakhir nilai ekonomi yang hilang dari kerusakan sarana dan prasana wisata terkait The economic value value is lost from the limits of related tourism facilities and infrastructure. Itu menggunakan replacement cost method. Berikut dalam <coughs> analisis. Oh, contoh penilaian dalam kasus tumpahan minyak dapat uh, menggunakan yang pertama untuk tahun 2009 sampai dengan tahun eh untuk pada tahun 2009 eh, khususnya pada kasus sementara yang pertama menggunakan dengan ledakan sumber sumber kilang minyak di Selat Timor yang berjarak 209 km dari Pulau Rote di Nusa Tenggara Timur. Yang kedua, pelaku PTT Exploration dan Production Company PTT EP Australia. Yang ketiga, tumpahan minyak mentah menyebar ke wilayah seluas 92 km persegi dan merusak pesisir di 13 kabupaten dan kota di Nusa Tenggara Timur, NTT, serta menghancurkan kehidupan nelayan serta petani rumput laut. Berikut kerusakan lingkungan utamanya terjadi pada mangrove seluas 700 hektar, padang lamun seluas 1.400 hektar dan terumbu karang seluas 1.200 hektar. Lima, pemerintah Republik Indonesia sudah menghitung total kerugian sebesar 27,4 triliun yang terdiri dari biaya kerusakan lingkungan sebesar 23 triliun dan biaya pemulihan sebesar 4,4 triliun. Tantangan dalam pengajuan klaim ganti kerugian, yang pertama, kejadian tumpahan minyak biasanya berlangsung di laut. Yang kedua, penanganan tumpahan minyak biasanya dilakukan secara cepat. Ketiga, data sumber daya kelautan dan perikanan belum akurat. Empat, kurangnya data, kurangnya data awal atas sumber daya kelautan dan perikanan. Lima, belum pernah dilakukan kajian atas nilai ekonomi, sumber daya secara komprehensif pada setiap wilayah. Kendala evaluasi ekonomi ini, kendala eh, evaluasi ekonomi ber, eh, sumber daya kelautan dan perikanan kasus montara yang pertama, Kendala yang dihadapi oleh pemerintah Indonesia dalam menggunakan evaluasi ekonomi terletak pada ketersediaan dasar. Hal ini menyebabkan sukarnya menghitung perubahan manfaat barang dan jasa yang dihasilkan oleh ekosistem. Dampak lanjutan yang ditimbulkan adalah lemahnya materi gugatan kerugian. Yang kedua, kejadian yang terjadi pada tahun 2009 tersebut masih belum menemukan kata sepakat sebagai sampai saat ini bahkan proses negosiasi melalui jalur non litigasi juga mengalami jalan buntu atau deadlock. Yang ketiga berdasarkan situs resmi PTTEP bahkan menyatakan tidak ada minyak dari kilang Montara yang masuk wilayah daratan Republik Indonesia sehingga tidak berdampak atau sangat kecil, kecil dampaknya terhadap kerusakan ekosistem pesisir dan laut. Belajar dari insiden Montara dan kerumitan klaim ganti kerugian atas insiden tersebut, maka pemerintah Provinsi Nusa Tenggara Timur membentuk Tim Penanggulangan Pencemaran dan Kerusakan Lingkungan Laut. Itu berdasarkan keputusan Gubernur Nusa Tenggara Timur nomor 260 garing kep, kep garing HK garing 2021. Tugas daripada tim ini adalah mengambil langkah-langkah konkret sebagai upaya penanggulangan pencemaran dan kerusakan lingkungan laut wilayah di wilayah perairan Provinsi Nusa Tenggara Timur. Kegiatan 
tim penanggulangan pencemaran dan kerusakan lingkungan laut eh, telah melakukan yang pertama melakukan pelatihan model tumpahan minyak di laut itu sudah dilaksanakan pada bulan Agustus tahun 2000 eh pada bulan Juni tahun 2022 yang kedua menginisiasi pendanaan penanggulangan insiden tumpahan minyak di laut telah dilaksanakan pada pada bulan September tahun 2022 penyusunan dan menguji menguji coba panduan sistem peringatan dini dan respon tumpahan minyak telah dilakukan pada bulan Agustus tahun 2022 penyusunan dan menguji, menguji coba panduan monitoring dan sampling sampling tumpahan minyak di laut telah dilaksanakan pada bulan November tahun 2022 dan yang berikut penyiapan pelatihan teknik penilaian dan penilaian dan pembersihan garis pantai serta menyiapkan konsep pusat laporan kejadian tumpahan minyak di laut itu masih dalam tahap perencanaan. Mungkin ini saja materi dari kami. Sekian dan terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam, salve. Om swastiastu, Om swastiastu, namo buddhaya, dan selamat siang. Um, thank you, Ibu Sulastri. Uh, somebody from, somebody is going to translate, I think, Pak, uh, Pak Yuka, imagine. Sahabat? Maybe we can do uh, some key points translation of Ibu Sulastri's presentation. I think we can do that. We have maybe another five minutes to do that. Anybody? No? Hey, Sherina, I'm still looking for the confirmation. Okay. I think uh, what I'll do is um while uh, while you're sorting it out, I will just invite uh Pui Huang to on her video for while I'm aware that there was a um question for her earlier. Then maybe we can address that first yes. while we are waiting for the key translation. Okay, uh Pui Huang, I think I'll address the question for you first. So there was somebody who was asking about tier classification, um, how to classify and decide a tier one, two, three of oil spill. Yes. Um, yeah. So I think tier one, tier two, tier three is a concept. Uh, tier concept is, I think in general, tier one is the local resources. Tier two is the regional or national resources. Tier three is looking to expand that you will need international uh, resources in this uh, to handle the oil spill incidents. So I think it's looking at uh, different capabilities. I would say that in tier one is always the local resource. We talk about whether your organizations have the equipments or the trained personnel that can handle the oil spill scenarios. So examples, um, maybe a lot of, uh, I think for the ports and terminals will be a docking at the at the birth site, then if there is a pipeline leakage or there's a these locations from the uh, pipes to the vessels, are you able to contain the oil at the jetty itself? So do you actually have boom or the those uh oil spill equipment like the booms to boom around the vessels to contain the oil within? Then you have schemas or dispersants to help to uh see recover or to disperse the oil into the water columns uh, in offshore. So in, in, in shoreline, I would say that this person is not there, the, the, the options to go for. So pardon me for that. So this person can be used for at least the water depth around 20 meters and more, so that I think the oil can be dispersed into the water column. But in, in this aspect is that for the tier one resources, do your own company has the resources to handle the oil spill at your site? 
So if not, then you want to expand to the tier two. So tier two will be looking into the regional or national resources. So as I mentioned, if it's like your um, your countries, do you have actually tier two uh, building organizations or oil organizations that can you put I think the resources into? So I think the Thailand have IESG, um, the Korea have K or uh, OEMs, uh, in Malaysia got PMAC, Indonesia got OSCTs. So uh, all these will help you to like, um, are you able to call upon them to tap on their resources? And then second, if you have like different organizations in these like, uh, maybe like the Greater Sunrise, they actually have different operators in their regions for the offshore activities. Do you actually have one mutual aid, uh, I would say agreements uh, to like uh, to tap on each other resources when there is an oil spill incidents. So rather than like, Tier 1 is the organization. So tier 2, you want to expand to regional or to the national resources where your neighbors uh, can help you or they can actually uh, loan you or you have an agreement that we can actually share the resources uh, in the event of oil spill. So I think it's more efficient and more effective in uh, managing the response. After which, you know that because it's continuous, maybe it's a well blow out and you know that it will go on for days and you are not able to hold it anymore, you, you, even within the, I would say that the clusters of organizations uh, in the region, then you want to seek for international uh, help. Like example, OSRL is actually a tier three organizations. So what makes us so special is also because of our area uh, dispersion capabilities, which is the C-130 in these regions, or even the B-727 in the UK, uh, so that we can actually uh, do a more, even these person applications uh, within a short, I would say not short hours, I think within at least for the wide area of uh, coverage uh, for this person application, uh, I think option wise. So tier three will be utilizing, I think, international resources. So also is one of them, or you can see even like the wildlife organizations that uh, you can actually tap on is like others, um, experts from other countries that actually can come into uh, the regions to help out or uh, to advise accordingly because maybe your this region do not have wildlife experts, then we can actually call upon uh, I think international uh, wildlife expert organizations in to, to help in this uh, uh, obviously handling of the oil wildlife response. So all these can be arranged that so it's built on the tier uh, concept so that you want to utilize the tier one first, then you expect to tier two and tier three. So it will be a proper kind of I would say that uh, notification and escalation procedures to be in place that you want to consider in your uh, OSCPs. Yeah, I hope that he answers the, the questions. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Hui Hang. I think that was a rather comprehensive uh, answer. Um, I'll just check in with um, Tatiana or anyone else from Etsy if there's anything else that you would like to add on to Ibu Sulastri's um, presentation. Uh, Sharina, I think uh, Mas Kaifin, we will translate for Ibu Sulastri. Please, Mr. Okay. Mas sure, Kaifin. Please, Ms. Mr. Kaifin. Maybe if you can get some key points out of uh, what her presentation was about, that okay. would be helpful. I will unmute him. Wait. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, sharing. So I will uh, uh, summary uh, the presentation of uh, Ibu Sulastri. So, uh, um, uh, Nusa, East Nusa Tenggara province facing a uh, threat from uh, oil spill. Uh, both from uh, transportation and exploration activities. Uh, um, based on uh, Montara uh, incident in 2009, that uh, is Nusa Tenggara province government uh, find uh, some difficulties uh, to claim about uh, environmental loss 
uh, and livelihood uh, loss. Uh, uh, they uh, form a team uh, to uh, manage uh, pollution and damage uh, uh, marine uh, marine pollution uh, and and damage. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, is Nusa Tenggara uh, Province government from uh, uh, team? to to manage uh, marine pollution and damage uh, so this team um, uh, main responsibility is uh, to make a concrete uh, step uh, in facing uh, marine pollution uh, and environmental damage uh, and the activities that uh, uh, this team has been done is uh, doing uh, training on uh, oil spill simulation. And uh, this team also uh, uh, develop uh, a, guide, uh, a guideline in uh, early warning system and has been uh, uh, consulted uh, in the in the Rotendau uh, district, and also this team uh, uh, develop uh, uh, develop a, a guideline uh, in monitoring and sampling for oil spill uh, in the sea. And it has been uh, uh, um, uh, has been trying uh, with uh, the mem with the member of uh, this team, and uh, also uh, the team uh, plan to to make a training on uh, a sh short line. Uh, shoreline, uh, shoreline cleanup and uh, uh, assessment technique, and also uh, plan to to uh, form a um, hotline center to report uh, oil spill uh, incident. Uh, so that's the Ebola's three uh, presentation back to sharing. Okay, thank you, Kaifin, for the uh, quick summary. Um, and do we have any questions for um, Ibu's last three presentation from, from the floor? If you do have, then you can just unmute and ask directly. Uh, okay, uh, Ibu last three. Uh, Sudah oke okay, yang saya sampaikan tadi. Okay, then I think with that, thank you so much uh, to all our resource speakers for your insights on the topics. Um, to our audience and participants, another reminder for you to complete and um, submit the attendance and feedback form. So the link to the form was already previously shared in the chat box. Okay, and with that, we would like to close out the webinar um, with a key, few key points. So um, Etsy has kindly shared a few uh, key points um, uh, for this closeout. So the Arafura and Timor Seas is what we know as the Ets region. It has many resources. Um, I think that was already covered uh, in Ibu's last three's uh, presentation. So we're talking about oil and gas reserves. So naturally then there are many oil concessions that are present in the region with some that have already been developed and some that are still in the planning process. Um, and because of that, the region itself is prone, very prone to oil spill incidents. And marine pollution needs to be addressed accordingly. So oil spill 
uh, especially it needs um, specific skill sets and then it needs um, specialized resources to address and oil spill handling will be much easier if the ex countries actually work together. So from the assessment um, conducted by etc 2 last year, the four ex countries, they have various levels of preparedness with regards to oil spill, with Australia being um, one of the most advanced one. Okay, so therefore, um, you know, together with OSRL, etc 2 actually has been conducting these quarterly webinars throughout the year with the main objective to build awareness and knowledge of possible oil spill incidents and how to prepare and respond accordingly. And uh, with this, uh, the hope was that, you know, it will help ex countries to understand the extent of the issues and also to encourage regional cooperation in the future. Okay. Um, finally, so all good things um, come to an end. So on behalf of etc 2 we would like to share our gratitude to all the resource speakers who have shared their knowledge, have shared their experience, um, you know, in the various webinars that we have conducted this year. And also to you participants who have attended our webinars. Um, so please feel free to visit um, www.oilspillresponse.com or www.etc uh, dash program.com uh, for recording of the webinars. So if you'd like to catch up previous webinars, feel free to log on uh, to these websites. Okay. And with that, uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time and participation in this webinar. Until we meet again, stay safe and well. Good afternoon, everyone.